You get back there much? No. I guess everyone thinks they grew up in the worst place on earth, huh? What's up everybody, Greg and Ryan here for another breakdown of Castle Rock. This is episode 5, Harvest. Now there are spoilers ahead, you have been warned. Go watch the episode and get back here. Oh yeah. But first, make sure to subscribe to Universe where we got you covered for comic deep dives, TV breakdowns, and movie reviews. Alright, let's jump into our initial thoughts in this episode. And uh, For me, again, J.J. Abrams, anytime his name's attached to anything, I'm gonna think Lost. And this felt very much like a middle of the road lost episode where you know mystery's kicking in but there are no answers just yet and they just pile on a little bit more a little bit more on there it, i'm okay with this but no answers whatsoever yet i'm okay with it too i mean it's sort of delicate mm -hmm. and to me it did feel like a little bit of a low point or maybe a valley in the series so far where after this sort of high point or climax with the mass shooting in the end of the fourth episode, you know, you're thinking, okay, what's next? Like, this is, you know, this is maybe the end of the Shawshank leg of the story. Maybe we're moving on to, like, new territory. The kid's going to get out or, you know, something something major is, is going to go on. We're going to see this shift in the story and sort of instead we get, like, eh, it's just the next couple of days. Town's uh, still, you know, you know doing the, their thing. The kid couch surfs for a little bit, and, you know, we, we get a couple more pieces of information, but it's not, it's not like the kid got out and the town went crazy. Like, it's, well, it's not, I mean, there's a little of that. Hey. There's a little of that, but it's not, like, it's on. It wasn't like <laughs> that. It, it was more like, okay, so we're going to go to the next part of the story. There's no key moment yet where... Everyone's like, oh shit, we have to figure out something about this kid. That's well, the, right, and in terms of like that sort of classic three-act storytelling structure, yeah. we don't have a hook yet for the characters really, that binds yeah, them yeah, together. Bind, yeah. And, you know, the hook that we had that was, I mean, it was tenuous, but the hook that we had at the beginning of the season was this wrongfully incarcerated kid. It was all kind of BS, but it was there. Now that the kid's out, we're, we're now sort of really kind of like, well, Henry's move now is to just get the kids settled and leave like there isn't we're not on a journey i'm lou hadley who are you last week in the comments we had a lot of people saying that they thought the kid was good or at the very least not evil and that henry might be the real baddie in the story while I wouldn't say that this episode actually confirms that, I'd say that it probably feels like it's leaning in that direction. They're playing of, with that. Like, at least leaning in the direction of Kid is good and Henry is bad, but more in so far as neither are actually confirmed. And we're getting a little long in this series yeah. to not have a confirmation. Well, the one thing I noticed from this entire episode is they're drawing a line in the sand of good and evil. You got the chessboard, the white, Crimson, red, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then also you just have this yin and yang between the two of them, Henry and the kid. You have them both doing the test. Uh, right, they both they both have the sort of psychological test mm -hmm. that are almost identical. Oh, white, church, dog, family. Face, velvet, red, church, family. And then there is the connection between like the little, like soap man, I guess. Yeah, yeah, the, the little carvings. Yeah, so the the kid built a cage out of bookshelves in Molly's office and left behind some shreds that she wasn't sure what it was. But as she leaves her office, we see the little mm -hmm. white guy on the bridge, which maybe represents Alan or 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 Ruth. I'm not sure, or whether there's even a whole other thing going on there. Still, the mystery. Right, the Just mystery. Again. <laughs> but it mirrors the shot from episode one where Henry is holding the little guy uh, when he's just been rescued by Alan uh, from the lake. So there's definitely a mirroring, definitely a connection between the two. Um, I think you said like a yin and yang thing going on. Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked if the warden got it wrong and the kid was meant to be Henry. I, get, I can see that twist in there, but at the same time, 
We do know that this kid still is, he's got some kind of curse, he's evil, we don't know what his powers are just yet, something's up here, it's not good. Right, like when he goes into the house after he leaves Strand's office at night. Oh yeah. So there's the family having a birthday party and then like they basically like murder each other, or at least that's the implication. It sounds like I loved and it. as a horror fan, I just loved it because you don't see a thing. You don't see any of it. But the it's question gruesome. there, though, right, is is that he made that happen? Like we don't know. No, that's the thing. You don't know if he made it happen, but he looks at that knife in a way that either he could tell the future and he knew what was going to happen. Or he was testing out his powers and see how far he could take this. I don't, I'm not willing to think that he was testing out his powers as much as maybe he just saw the future. I mean, there's still a case to be made that he doesn't have like totally active powers, right? Yeah. Like it's sort of implied that he gave the white supremacist cancer, but all we got actually out of their interaction was him saying not to touch him. And when we see him on the roof later in this episode and talking to Molly, he definitely expresses this sense of like guilt and not belonging. And you know, the warning not to touch him might be sort of tied to some of that stuff too. Like just like, don't, you don't want to touch me because I'm dangerous. I know that I'm dangerous. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to be dangerous. I am dangerous. And then of course, obviously on the other side is what's the deal with Henry in this regard? Like. You know, the Ruth draws attention to his amnesia again when she's in the hospital after her suicide attempt. Um, he's now got this mysterious ringing in his ears that, you know, what that is explicitly tied to, we don't know. How do you treat it? There's no magic bullet. Sometimes it's a gradual process. Other cases, you put someone back in their own home with their own junk and it's just like flipping a light switch. There was there were one of the comments, or actually a few of the comments that we had last week were suggesting that the warden was actually caging the kid to protect him until the time when he was needed to save people. Which is also kind of interesting. I like that. Although I'm a little skeptical. And you know, <laughs> what uh, lands me on more skeptical too is the last scene in the episode where Alan and the kid are out in the woods and that's where we learn that the kid is basically ageless or he doesn't age or he hasn't aged since uh, Warden Lacey put him in the hole. And he said, you know, Pangborn asks him if he's the devil. He says no. He says he can help Ruth. And all that is definitely sort of leaning towards good. But when he says, you don't know what's going on here, do you? The way he says that was not exactly what you would consider to be a benevolent delivery. Yeah, I think he could be a total monkey paw. Just, you get what you ask for, but there's gonna be a little bit of a twist to it at the end. Like he's gonna touch Ruth and she'll be healed, but she's also a monster at this point right. or something. Like she has forgotten that she's a monster. Her and Matthew Deaver were always monsters and terrible mm -hmm. people. And one of them got killed and the other one lost her mind, and curing her of her madness brings back the evil. Oh God. I could see that. Finally, something that kind of ties them together is that Molly recognizes something sort of unique about both of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she describes uh, Henry as being deafening to her senses, and the kid, she says, With him. It's just, it's like I was listening to the pain of everyone in this town all at once. The idea that the kid is a reflection of the sorrow and suffering of the town. Garmin... Brosia. <laughs> right. Okay, now some references or things you might have missed that we noticed while watching this episode. Let's do it. When Henry asked the doctor about what to do with the kid, she says she might be able to pull some strings at Juniper Hill. This is an insane asylum that appears in a few King books, most notably, of course, are Needful Things and It. When the kid is leaving Shawshank Prison, in the background you see some firefighters and prisoners being loaded onto, like, some trucks. Mm -hmm. Now, I thought they weren't gonna say anything, but Henry does call attention to the 
prisoners being used to fight the fire, which is something that's throughout the episode, of course, right? There's a wildfire at Black Mountain that's taking place. This is the prison work program that is in the newspapers that we saw about Lacey in a few episodes past. Yep. And that is definitely a thing. Like, they are calling attention to it. And I'm sort of wondering. You're uh, gonna get some work like, program scene. I think that, you know, maybe there is some connection between everything that's going on and how the work program is used. I'm thinking maybe it's some culty stuff. I think maybe they're just taking prisoners out there and sacrificing them. I'm waiting on that. I want a cult vibe. I feel like we're gonna get that any second now. We're gonna get a group of people, gooba gaba, in a room together. So it, maybe it's the cult. Could be. When the kid goes to the family's house and there's the birthday party, the birthday party is for Gordy. And this is more of like an observation than like an obvious and definite reference, but it is a use again of the name Gordy, which shows up in the body slash stand by me. Um, this isn't that character. And I still hold to the possibility that that character is actually the character Gordon from the previous episode who was buying the house. That could still actually be the character from the body. I'm down with that. I like that idea if it's just a subtle nod. It's just a subtle reference at the very end. You find out maybe when Molly's filling out the paperwork at the end, you see the full name. You're like, oh, my friends called me Gordy, blah, blah. That's cool. I like that. But then we also have now Jackie Torrance. So the moment that we knew was probably coming at some point about Jackie and her last name, of course, is Torrance. Uh, I didn't think they would handle it this way, where she's the second she's smoking, I my eyes got wider and I just thought, oh no, is this this it? Is this where she's gonna like just wax philosophically when about she everything? She mentions her family. I thought, okay, here we go. Okay, I thought. <laughs> All right, that's good. That's good. Stop there. Stop there. I had this uncle, though. He was redder, too. And then one winter, he just flipped his lid and tried to axe murder his wife and kid at some fancy ski resort. And then even there, I was like, okay, okay, that's enough info on her. I got it. I get it. I get it. She's, uh, she's a Torrance. They just hammer it in. Oh, okay. It was like each sentence was one sentence too many. It was like, it was, I think I could have, I could have actually been fine with, there's some crazy stuff in my family. She could have like she could have mentioned the that's it. The she, uncle who was a writer was actually kind of enough for me. I was like, okay, that's that's good. I'll 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 live with that. But then, the next line is, who tried to kill his wife and kid with an axe in a fancy ski lodge, and I was like, oh come on. And then like just to go further, oh to piss off my parents who never want to talk about it, I took his name. Uh, 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 uh. The funny thing about that whole thing is that I love the Jackie character. Um, I think Jane Levy's great in the role. Yeah, it's just that scene irked me a little bit where they could have stuck the landing a little bit better than just, you know, my dad was blah, 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 and my uncle, blah, 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 he killed all these, you didn't need to go there. Just a little bit. Speaking of Jackie, she leaves a copy of the Castle Rock Call on Molly's desk, which attributes the Black Mountain Fire to careless leaf peepers, which are tourists who visit New England to look at leaves. King actually wrote about them once in a winter edition of The New Yorker from 1998. That is some esoteric shit. And if you're listening closely, you can hear a very obvious nod to the body slash stand by me right here. Okay, let's jump into final questions. I'm still sticking with my theory that I think Gaunt has something to do with the kid. I'm still holding out for that, but I can't deny that there are some Dark Tower references going out throughout this entire series so far. It's subtle, um, I don't know where they're going, but you can't deny it. And one of the main ones was this smiley face from the week before. I had this whole thing on like the history of the smiley face and I was gonna put it in the video. And then I quickly realized that, oh wait, no, that's a Randall Flagg thing too. He had a smiley face. So, and then again, I was thinking, okay, how, how far are we going with Dark Tower here? Are there gonna be any major references or reveals of characters? And then also the Crimson King with the chessboard. I, I just don't know where Castle Rock the show and Dark Tower, how these two merge together, and I can't see it where someone's gonna walk out there 
and say, I'm Randall Flagg. Well, I, I don't know. That actually speaks to sort of my question, which is, where are the bad guys? Like the bad guys, the bad people, yeah. the, you know, Stephen King stories to me are often just populated by people who are miserably bad people. They, you know, torture the people in their lives, they abuse the people in their lives. They're not necessarily the monster or the great evil in this story, but there's just distinctly terrible people that don't have any clear shred of like decency or humanity. And, you know, it's sort of like that Ace Merrill character that is sort of hinted at in this show. There's the kid Merrill, but the kid's kind of a schmuck. Maybe the bad guy's Matthew Deaver. <laughs> I mean, it could be, look, that casket, the exploding coffin syndrome, uh, which I am never Googling ever, ever, ever. But, I mean, he could just blow out of that casket like Dracula or some shit. That brings me to the other question, which is, really, what are everybody's powers? I feel like they don't need to be defined, but they're distinctly undefined right now. I hope it's a new power. I hope it's not actually The Shining and the writers just made something new, entirely different. And then we're going to get to explain later on, obviously, but I and hope is it's it, different. And is it the same for all of them? Like, the most defined mm -hmm. that we have is with Molly Strand. And I think for mm -hmm. three consecutive episodes, she's made three separate analogies trying to describe her abilities to Henry, and in all three scenes, he completely fails to comprehend Peace what she's out. talking about. Yeah. And then on the other side we have Henry, who is having daydreams in episode four and now has this ringing in his ears in episode five. And then the kid, again, we'll just keep coming back to, which is like, is it, is it something with touching people? Is it some mind control thing? Is it just something that's a field around him? Is it passive? Um, I feel like there ought to be some kind of definition at some point. Well, I have a feeling there are two characters that you might have noticed in this episode that may be able to tell us what those powers are. It's these dudes. Who the hell are these guys? These weirdos in the bushes. Sure, but keep an eye on them because I'm pretty damn certain they're gonna show up. Cigarettes, some dick halloran lines, some exposition. <laughs> here's what the powers are, here's what you do. We gotta get this kid out of here, or Henry, you're the evil guy, actually. Something like that's coming with these guys. And that's and, Rory Culkin, by the way. And they just get wiped out. <laughs> yes, I think it'll be Ruth Deaver with the ax and she'll cut them both up. Mm -hmm. That's not gonna happen. That's not Last thing I think is the flashback with the warden and the kid. Kids in the cage eating bread and the warden is remembering when he incarcerated the kid and he talks about how sort of how full of his faith he was and how it was sort of dominating everything in his in all of his senses. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that he says to the kid you remember that crazy story you told me in your first night in here i mean is the story please don't put me in this hole <laughs> i'm a good person i go to church every sunday or actually is there something in there but i think i think it's actually telling though that he says that he's he was so dominated by his feelings that he might have just been very dismissive of what the kid said. Like that, he said, he referred to it as a crazy story. Like it just maybe threw him off just a little bit as he was wrongfully imprisoning a human being. God. And finally, we pulled a few questions from YouTube. Writer asks, what is Jackie's role in all of this? Let's see, so far to bring weed, munchies, and the worst Stephen King reference so far in the series. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but you know, that said, I think Jane Levy is really good in the role. And she is the most conspicuously not crazy character so far in the series, which I think means better than even odds that she's the devil. All God's children. Tingle Jove asked, When they did the fist bump, did anyone else notice the Twin Peaks-esque glitchy sound? 
we're not, not going to talk, talk about Judy. Judy. All right, that's it for us over here, everybody. Let us know what you thought of the episode in the comments section down below. And until next time, keep it tuned to GameSpot Universe. Bye-bye.